Thanks everybody for uh, showing up. I'm interested to, to give you a little overview of one of the many projects that BitGo has been working on over the past year. And uh, Prova is basically our first foray into a, a custom permissioned blockchain. This is uh, something that came about after several years of talking with enterprises who wanted to get into the space but did not necessarily want your fully fledged permissionless open uh, blockchain that is very difficult to control. So after doing a lot of research and evaluating different technologies, we dove in and uh, after about a year of work, uh, both on the protocol side and our own infrastructure side, we've got an interesting new system that is going into production use right now. It should actually be starting to get used by real customers in the next uh, couple of months. So, what is Bitcoin? That's kind of where we have to start with a lot of these things. Hopefully, don't need to explain to most of the people here because we certainly do not have time for all of that. Um, of course, we're here because back in 2009, this new technology appeared uh, on an obscure mailing list for cryptographers and cypherpunks. And ever since then, we've all been kind of stumbling forward trying to figure out what it is that we've actually got here. And like what, what can we actually do with it? So uh, we, of course, began this journey because the current financial infrastructure has a lot of deficiencies, a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, as I'm sure all of us are aware, there are a number of different problems that can result in shall we say, unfair uh, practices, unfair advantages by different players in the system who can take advantage of, of the way that the infrastructure is currently set up. So just due to the nature of like centralization and concentration of, of power within these various hierarchical systems, we find that uh, people manage to get themselves in positions of power, positions of trust, where they can then take advantage of uh, really the infrastructure of the system itself in order to make changes or uh, convince people to do things that are actually against their own best interests. So, as we are aware of like the way that traditional ledgers and databases work, generally you're going to have like one master copy of your database. That is like the source of truth. And that is generally quite efficient from a technical standpoint uh, because you don't have to worry about like replication errors or uh, you know reconciling uh, multiple different uh, sources of data. But the downside is you're, what you're doing is you're putting all of your, your data under the trust of one entity. And usually this is in a very ob obscure uh, format where like it's not open. Uh, only a few trusted people within an organization might have the ability to actually do an audit on the database or the ledger. And uh, this can result in issues kind of that grow out uh, as the network around this this ledger grows where you you end up creating systemic problems due to the trust and due to the lack of uh, visibility so as a result this can create a very a uh, powerful single point of failure which can result in the entire system potentially collapsing or becoming unstable if uh, tiny little things go wrong uh, at the, the main point of your source of, of truth. So that of course can be anything like uh, hacks or, or fractional reserve banking that, that results in uh, bank runs uh, or of course really like what we saw in, uh, in 2008 is just sort of this extreme like layering of complexity upon complexity upon complexity to the point that basically nobody actually understands what's going on in the system anymore and eventually enough people figure out what is going on and the whole thing kind of falls over and a lot of trust gets lost. So 
Then comes along this completely different concept of distributed ledgers where we're really inverting the entire system. Where in, instead of having a, a single trusted uh, source of truth, we then say, okay, everybody checks everybody else's work, right? So we are basically copying, replicating data all around uh, a network of entities that is participating and they are all checking each other's work and if anybody finds anything that has gone wrong, they reject uh, the changes and as a result, we have this new sort of automated consensus system. But of course, the tricky part is you have to build a protocol that can basically automate whatever it is that you want to come to a consensus about amongst your entities uh, to then have the machines basically do the auditing for you automatically and throw a uh, red alert, uh, throw a, a lot of alarms if the, uh, the consensus logic itself finds any problems with the activity that is happening on the network. This results in a much more robust system because we no longer have single points of failure. Uh, if some, something happens you know, at one particular node, that's going to be a localized failure rather than a systemic failure that can cascade across the entire ecosystem. It also just cre creates a much more open type of model where you could argue that it's, uh, it's easier for people to build on top of this system because they have a better idea of what's actually going on on uh, the layers that they're, they're building on top of as an infrastructure. So for your, your standard like marketing uh, checklist here of you know, why would you want blockchains versus traditional databases, of course we've got uh, transparency, we've got uh, what you, you often hear called immutability, but I would say a, a better um, description is just tamper evidence. Um, tamper evidence is really what comes along with any type of blockchain uh, record because you're, you're really you're creating this cryptographically chained history or audit log of everything that has ever happened within the system and while of course it is possible for like a hacker to go in and change data, uh, they cannot change the data in a way that is not easily evident because they're going to be breaking one of those links in the cryptographic chain somewhere. So at the very least you have this tamper evidence where you can easily tell your computer, you know, go back and, and audit all of the data and if anything goes wrong, we know that we need to get some human auditors in and check what happened right here. Um, you know, maybe it was a software failure, maybe uh, it was actual uh, you know, malfeasance by some actor within the system. Uh, immutability, I would say, is tamper evidence plus some sort of extreme cost to tampering with the system. So within Bitcoin, of course, that is the proof of work. Within other systems, you might have some sort of proof of stake or federated consensus. The, the actual consensus algorithm for creating that high cost of tampering is... Uh, less important if you're talking about a permission system where most of the actors who are operating the network somewhat trust each other. And we'll talk a little bit about that later with uh, Prova. And then, of course, with, with regards to the actual, uh, the trust nature of it, you're, you're no longer relying upon one entity to be telling you the truth about what the state of the system is because you've validated everything yourself. And with regard to costs, um, I would say it's less efficient from a technical like database uh, standpoint of you know actual queries and updates, but what you really find is like you're, you're potentially lowering a lot of costs if you can get the, the sort of human auditors uh, out of the equation as much as possible. So really what we're trying to do is uh, automate away uh, a lot of the compliance costs within a particular system so that you, know, you can still have some human auditors that check on it every once in a while, but the vast majority of the auditing uh, gets automated so that it's happening 24-7, 365 without necessarily needing oversight of a human. And of course, uh, we believe that these systems are much more robust. Um, 
for a number of reasons, uh, one of which, of course, is just the, the fact that we're, we're now using public-private key cryptography so that instead of having like all of your secrets or all of your private data once again in one database that needs to be highly guarded, instead what we're doing is we're spreading out the uh, actual keys to the system amongst all of the users. So you could think of it instead of having like a single um, highly vulnerable uh, honeypot of uh, valuable data that is going to get attacked, we instead have sort of edge security so that instead we have hundreds if not thousands or tens of thousands of users that are actually controlling their own private keys that allow them to access the system. So then, once again, uh, any one of those people, of course, can be hacked and might have their, their assets uh, stolen from them, but that is a, a localized problem rather than a systemic problem. It, it, it results in a much uh, less fragile system. You could even say anti-fragile system in some cases. So if you want to use a uh, how do you actually figure out like what kind of blockchain or what kind of distributed ledger do you want? Do you want a permissionless ledger? Do you want permission? Does it need to be public, private? What's the simplest way to build it? What's the most robust technology available? Uh, can the technology scale to meet whatever your throughput requirements or latency requirements or other technical needs are? There's a lot of questions uh, that need to be asked uh, before you just go off and start building on some sort of blockchain or distributed ledger technology. So what is Prova? Well, Prova is open source blockchain protocol. We specifically designed it for digitizing physical assets. The, the goals that we're going for here is uh, transparency in uh, ownership and transfer of ownership, reduced cost of auditing the database, and just general global access to this network. Now, unlike Bitcoin, it, it is permissioned, it will have, you know, uh, governance and uh, administrators, but it will also have some additional safety rails that you don't see in Bitcoin itself. And a lot of this stuff that we built was directly as a result of speaking to you know, traditional financial institutions, talking about what their needs are uh, from regulatory requirements and from, uh, you know, investor requirements. So in terms of you know, what type of blockchain is Prova on this spectrum, it is a public permissioned blockchain. And uh, public permissionless blockchains are like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, whatever. Uh, private blockchains, you can probably say, I guess Hyperledger um, is, is much more private. Uh, it is definitely also permissioned blockchain. Um, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, you can do either with Hyperledger, right? Yeah. So that has even more flexibility. And from a technical specification, Prova is a fork of BTCD, which is one of the older uh, Bitcoin implementations, uh, specifically written in Go, and. It is using the UTXO style accounting model as opposed to accounting style, which is really more what like uh, Ethereum and, and Ripple use. Um, one of the differences though is that because at BitGo, we are a multi-signature uh, wallet provider and we require all of our blockchains to support two out of three multi-sig for our security model, we actually set up Prova to be a multi-sig only blockchain. So all address all wallets, all transactions within Prova are uh, two out of three multi-sig. And this actually gives us some interesting properties. One of those is this concept of the safe address. And what that basically means is that in Bitcoin or in any public permissionless blockchain, all you need to do to create an address is generate a private key with a little a bit of entropy, and then you've got your, your public key and you can drive an address from that. Uh, then you can send money to it, and then you can throw that private key away or lose it, or you know, some act of nature causes you uh, to not be able to recover it. Uh, once that private key is gone, uh, nobody in the entire world has the ability to recover that money or those digital assets for you. So. 
we wanted to prevent that from ever being able to happen within our own system and the way that we do that is that whenever you are generating an address in the system it has to be a two out of three key setup and uh, one of those keys has to be um, provisioned by an administrator to a wallet service provider uh, and one of the the third keys has to be provisioned to a key re recovery service so basically long story short the user can generate any key that they want and screw up and lose it but there are always two other entities within the system who will have uh, the other two of those three keys for that address and will thus be able to recover uh, you know given if the user goes through their recovery process with their uh, AML KYC uh, process and will thus be able to recover any any funds that they manage to lose uh, from their own uh, ignorance or bad luck or what have you. Now we do use uh, proof of work for our consensus algorithm but it is not um, quite the same as Bitcoin. I believe we're using uh, the Kekak algorithm, which is related to Ethereum, I believe. But, but you still need miners. We, yes, yeah, so we, you still need miners, but uh, for example, you could basically have just a single CPU on, on each miner. That's really what we're expecting to happen with the Royal Mint Gold when it rolls out. There will be you know maybe like a dozen miners on the network, but these miners aren't going to be using ASICs. They're probably not even going to be using GPUs. They're just going to be using CPUs, so very low electrical cost. And the reason why that is okay is because we added some additional logic which is the throttling that we're talking about which is basically that um, amongst all of the other stuff within the system that is permissioned the miners are permissioned so uh, in order to be a miner on this system you actually have to get a special key provision to you from the administrator of the system so that's going to keep a lot of bad actors out and then on top of that um, it's not going to be possible for anyone uh, with a single mining key to 51% attack the system because we have uh, some throttling built in that basically says like if uh, three out of the past ten blocks were created by you know this provisioned minor key and they try to create another block reject it so uh, question yeah why did we use proof of work versus like proof of stake or anything else or, or proof of elapsed time or whatever yeah uh, basically simplicity um, it doesn't really really matter because it's all permissioned in the first place uh, we, we we could have just used some sort of like federated round robin signing um, but I mean it, it's all essentially going to end up with the same security model because you you will have some super administrator sitting on top of these miners and if they uh, start uh, causing havoc then the administrator is just going to whip out their key and deprovision that miners ability to create blocks at all so uh, yeah we could we could swap out any type of, of consensus algorithm and probably will long term one of the other reasons why we did keep it proof of work though is that that potentially gives the flexibility for this to turn into a, more of an open permissionless mining system um, basically all that b would be required to turn it into that is that the administrator releases the keys into the public for mining and says okay have at it you know we're going to try to make this a fully fledged proof of work system where anybody who wants to can join in um, it's flexibility but because this whole system is permissioned and I think you're gonna find that uh, like the Royal Mint and, and CME and, and companies that end up using it they're, they're gonna be tweaking stuff as they go forward um, experimenting basically Well, yeah, so, so that is another thing, uh, at least within Royal Mint Gold, uh, there is no subsidy. Now, we'll be able to collect transaction fees, so that's kind of 
an incentive to mine. But we expect that at least in the beginning, as we're bootstrapping the Royal Mint Gold Network, um, it's only going to be, you know, the companies that partner together in the first place, uh, they're already highly incentivized to keep the system up and running because they've spent who knows how many millions of dollars getting it built in the first place. Then long term, it may eventually transition over to something where, you know, we're at, they're actually paying for, for hash power if they feel they, they want to change that. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of permissioning that will also go into. Uh, we've got multiple layers of stuff going on. Um, yep. Uh, how accepted? Yeah. So you account modeling. Um, there are. When you get into regulated industries, at the like. I'm not aware of like any you know legal issues uh, or or reasons why you might prefer one over the other. I mean, the reason why we preferred UTXO over account model is because like it provides a stronger history of the flow of of that money. Like you you have you have not only a blockchain of of blocks with you know the timestamp transactions, but you have a chain, a historical chain of inputs and outputs. So input, output, input, output. Um, it just it seems to be more robust. Um, and you know the as a result of building of going through that whole blockchain and and processing all the transactions, you then you end up with you know the UTXO set, which is like your your current snap of your state of the system. Um, accounts can also work well too, but uh, now we, we ended up going with the, the UTX2 model mainly because we felt like Bitcoin had a, a better, longer, more proven track record. Um, and I'll also talk about like why we didn't do any smart contract stuff or anything like that <laughs> in a bit. Um, but this this system gives you uh, a number of features, mainly you know related around the the asset issuance and the um, enabling and disabling of various actors within the system. So we have permissioning. Basically, you have your administrators who own the system for uh, from multiple perspectives, and then. They give permission to wallets, they give permission to uh, validators or miners, and then the, the wallets are generally going to be like the AML KYC type entities that then give permission to the individual users who get into the system and start using it as a you know, peer to peer digital asset. So to kind of take a look at how that works, um, we've got here you can see the, the wallet service provider, they're always going to have one of those three keys. Uh, the user is always going to have one of their three keys. And then there's going to be a key recovery service that is a completely third party uh, that will keep a recovery key, uh, you know, just in case um, somebody manages to lose one of their keys and we need to, to go and uh, reconstitute enough data to be able to recover somebody's assets. And so if a user comes in and they pass through the KYC a AML compliance stuff with the wallet service provider, they get into the system, now they can basically act the same as any user acts once they get into Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or whatever. And they will use their key to half sign a transaction. They will then send that half sign transaction to their wallet and the wallet will decide based upon any number of security parameters whether or not to uh, co-sign the transaction. If they do co-sign the transaction, then it becomes valid from a protocol standpoint, gets broadcast out on the network, the miners confirm it, it gets into the blockchain, and now you have your uh, tamper evident uh, audit log that will remain as such for all time. From a kind of higher level, a uh, similar type of stuff happens with the administrator, where you have, you'll have multiple administrators with multiple keys, and uh, we have some sort of um, we, offline uh, signing software that we've developed to basically think of it as like uh, when you're, you're um, 
your guys who are manning the, the Minuteman missiles uh, for the, the army and they have to put in their keys at the same time and you know turn them uh, synchronously in order to initiate a rocket launch or what have you. Similar type of stuff with making administrative level changes to a Prova based system where we have to get you know X out of Y administrators to come together and sign a administrator transaction which can do any number of things such as create or destroy assets in the system, uh, provision or deprovision the wallet service providers, or provision or deprovision the uh, validators or miners on the system. And once enough uh, administrators come together and create that transaction, just like any other transaction, it gets broadcast out on the network, it's confirmed in a block, and at that point uh, some aspect of the system gets changed. So we are, like I said, we're, we're focused on very narrow thing here. Uh, we're not trying to be everything for everybody. Uh, we're, we're trying to be highly secure and highly specific in what the system is trying to do. Um, I think I've, I've already really talked about all of the stuff on here. Um, and Come again? Right, so, uh, so this is its own blockchain, right? So it starts the Genesis block. Yeah, so the, the UTXO is the asset. Like there's, there's nothing complicated about, you know, using like op returns to, 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 to color uh, assets or really anything else. It's um, one asset uh, for the entire blockchain. So, so this is, yeah, it's not like we're... Really trading, oh, you're trading to display supply chain program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, if you wanted to have multiple digital assets, uh, you would need to have multiple different networks. Like, we're not trying to support uh, you know, multiple assets on the same network. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so so in Prova, the the UTXO is the asset. Um, I'll talk a little bit about like how that works with Royal Mint and Gold in just a second. Uh, Prova, of course, is open source. Um, I think there's a URL on here somewhere, provachain.com, I believe. But uh, it's on it's on our GitHub, just GitHub.com/bitgo. Uh, you'll find Prova there, and of course, all the instructions you need to get it up and running, it's pretty easy uh, to, to get a, a Go uh, project compiled and running. And with the, one of the reasons that we chose Go as opposed to like the Bitcoin Core implementation, which is C++, is that we just felt like uh, Go was the most uh, developer friendly because we wanted this to be an implementation that uh, the vast majority of developers would be able to get into and start, you know, playing around with. And I found I haven't you know, written much Go myself, but found that it wasn't uh, particularly challenging. Um, I, I'm still terrible at C++, so I don't contribute to Bitcoin Core very much. Uh, who uses Prova at the moment? This was really like for uh, the Royal Mint and Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the idea there being that uh, Royal Mint is this thousand year old institution that has been uh, vaulting gold bullion. And basically they are probably one of the most trustworthy entities in, in the entire world at this point. And what they wanted to do was just kind of uh, upgrade their own infrastructure and be able to enable new types of, of uh, functionality for their own users. So um, the ability to have like a peer-to-peer -peer and auditable uh, digital asset was appealing to them. Uh, they're able to offer a number of things that tr most like physical gold vaulting institutions have not been able to offer up to this point. Uh, let's see, a little marketing material. Sorry, is that all that's being used for the CME right now? The Royal Mint Gold? Uh, yeah, so, so Royal Mint Gold is the first like production use of this. Yeah, uh, we've been, I mean, we've been in testing phases for at least like six months now. Um, 
And at this point, like the only thing stopping them from turning it on and having you know real users sign up, I believe, is just like their own uh, internal bureaucracy, you know, like trying to plan stuff. Last I heard, it was supposed to be you know yeah, it's supposed to be before the end of the year. So we're coming up on the end of the year. Uh, should should be going live. Yeah. You can actually see the transactions. Yes, everyone. Uh, the blockchain transactions. Yes. Yeah. So that's the. It's public and permissioned. Um, you could. Uh, I'm sure it would be possible to create, you know, a private closed source version of it. Um, Yeah, yeah, so they're at least within RMG. Now, of course, because it's open source and you can fork off and, and add whatever you want, uh, anything is possible. But at least within RMG, they're, while the, the blockchain data itself is pseudonymous, uh, every actor within the, the system is going to be identified. So, so every user has to go through AML KYC, um, and you know you won't be able to look at the blockchain and say, "Oh, that was Bob," you know, sending 100 grams of gold to Jill or whatever. But the administrators of the system would be able to figure that out. Also, the chain users can't tell who the other user is; they can just see all the transactions. Yeah. Basically, not you know, it's the same thing as. It's the same as Bitcoin, uh, right? Uh, you, Solomon Brothers trading with. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if you're running a full node uh, for for Prova or RMG or whatever, you would be downloading, validating all the transactions. Of course, you could perform the same type of chain an analytics that a number of people perform on the public blockchains that are already out there. Um, but you would not be able to really identify who is behind it unless you were in one of the systems. Where, like they have that mapping. Private keys that have been handed out to the users. Or the data gets stolen, but that never happens. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. If there was some sort of breach, if there was some sort of breach, um, and of course, you know, you could you, you could argue from from the top down. You know, the system is controlled by a set of like root administrator keys. So if those keys got stolen, the whole system could get screwed up. So that's why we built uh, you know additional uh, offline signing software and and have it additional security practices for how we believe the administrators should go about creating those transactions. So um, they will never be creating any of those uh, administrator transactions on any device that is you know, touching the internet, for example. Like those keys will remain on specific hardware that never touches the internet. Oh yeah, financial uh, the values. Uh, hey, if if anybody wants to add that functionality, or I, I guess maybe is it in the elements project? Yeah, pull in. Well, elements of course is the C plus plus, so you have to port it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, if there's demand for that, uh, it would be great. Uh, you know, this is an open source project, and we're trying to get people interested. And, uh, you know, contributing new features and. Uh, whatever there's demand for, hopefully, will uh, get added in. Uh, you know, I doubt that the Royal Mint would want that, but who knows, somebody else might want it. What are the customer reactions to hearing that they're, at least, bad news of their trade coming out there for everyone to see versus right now, where it's kind of like a dark box? Yeah, so to, to be specific, um, the at least the normal trades, the normal gold trades that happen are still going to happen on like a centralized uh, exchange in most cases. Okay. Now, you can, you can use the peer-to-peer -peer aspects of this to send the digital assets to other people who are in the network, but we expect that most of the trades are still going to happen at a like traditional centralized trade exchange. And in fact, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, where the, one of the partners in this project is uh, Alpha Point, which I believe is one of the, the trading engines. So. Um, since I am like way on the back end of doing infrastructure stuff, I have no idea what the customers think. <laughs> but yeah, that's I have no idea what you they're doing the trade centralized and then they just publish the records watching after actually 
Yeah, I mean, we, we would expect that a lot of the trading will still happen in the centralized uh, exchanges, and then, you know, they're going to withdraw into their own wallets. And then, you know, they could potentially send back and forth with other users and other wallets in the system. Um, but, you know, that would be up to them. Uh, if somebody ended up building some, like, peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, decentralized trading exchange, then uh, that, that would be a possibility. Uh, let's see. So... Some of the, the, the reasons why the Royal Mint wanted this, um, basically trying to you know, get out of the very old school, uh, traditional uh, physical assets uh, and start to bridge the gap into digital assets. And really, because they have so much gold uh, in their vaults, they saw this as an opportunity actually to, to offer a, a no vault fee solution for the, the customer. So like one of the, the driving reasons why people might want to get in and use this system is that uh, you will have a like, cryptographically verifiable proof of ownership or at least proof of IOU to uh, physical gold. And you can call in, of course, that IOU and get delivery of the physical gold. But the difference between this and other physical gold IOU systems is that they will not be charging you any vaulting fees. So you can keep your, your digital gold assets as long as you want, and they're not going to be you know, chipping away the, uh, the amount that you have uh, held in their platform. I guess got a whole bunch of stuff, if that's even readable. Um, so, yes? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, take for instance, you know, you have your ball in, uh, in Singapore and all that stuff. Because yep. you already know at least, you know, say, a number and everything. Somebody can be that, says I have this and all that stuff. And, you know, obviously, you know, we don't have to have the list and all that stuff. What I'm saying, you, you're telling me that you don't want to charge for... Can you repeat that charge? Yeah, well, the, uh, the royal... We're, we're not paying that anymore. So I'm going to, I mean, buy and all that stuff. We're not, we're not paying for that anymore. Uh, the Royal Mint is not going to be charging the customers that use this Royal Mint Gold uh, platform. They're not going to be charging them ongoing vaulting fees. So if you have, you know, uh, a kilogram of digital gold, um, a lot of vaulting services would be charging you some sort of ongoing maintenance cost just to keep it in their vaults. Uh, but the Royal Mint has, uh, I guess they're just large enough and have been around long enough that they are able to offer a no vault fee solution, just probably because they just already have so much gold on hand that's going to be sitting there one way or another. Um, I forget how much we're talking about, but it's probably hundreds of millions, if not billions. Um, there's a lot of gold in there. Uh, and Actually, in the top right here, uh, we have noted that their, their gold in their vault gets reconciled daily and is fully audited every six months. So it would also be interesting to see like, how accessible those audits are. They must be posted somewhere because they have garnered quite a bit of trust over the past thousand years. Um, Let's see. So, you know, this is still a trusted solution, of course. You know, you, you, you have a, a trusted centralized third party that is holding the actual asset, and basically we're building a decentralized uh, layer that just gives us more um, auditability of like what's actually going on within the system. And gives you some new abilities, you know, to to send this money in a more efficient type of, of format. Like because we're now offering a, a network that is running like 24/7, 365. It's not like a lot of the traditional financial services that are only going to be operating in set hours on set days of the week. You are going to have a lot more freedom to move around these digital IOUs for the uh, digital digitized assets. 
Um, I know you were, someone was asking, like, can you actually see the transactions that happen? And let's see, explore.rmgchain.info uh, should be up and running. And you're not going to find a lot of transactions on there, of course, because I don't, I don't think they've actually taken the system live with their users yet. But we are creating blocks. Uh, we you know, have issued some uh, gold into the system. And at this point, it's just uh, spinning away, waiting for actual users to, to start getting into the system. So what, what is the RMG? Um, you could basically replace most of you know, these instances of RMG with Bitcoin or Litecoin or, or whatever. It's, uh, it's using the same type of uh, wallet platform that we have uh, used and expanded to support a number of different crypto assets over the years. And the, like I said, the onboarding process is going to be like AML, KYC that uh, is just required you know, from a regulatory standpoint. But once you get into the system, you can then send the money around, uh, send the assets around to anyone else with, inside the system without having to go and uh, you know, ask, uh, ask your favorite banker or ask your favorite administrator for uh, permission to do that. Uh, also, we had the, the questions about uh, trading and there is a uh, you know, fully fledged trading platform that is baked into this whole uh, Royal Mint Gold system. Uh, I believe, yeah, this was Alpha Point and their trading engine. And so, you know, the trader folks, market makers, I think, are going to find this interesting um, in comparison to, I guess, like normal uh, spot gold, like day traders. This, don't want to make any claims offhand, but this might be one of the first systems where it really is going to be like 24-7, 365 uh, gold trading. Or at least most other markets that I'm aware of, you know, are only open during specific hours. So are you putting every trade to the blockchain? No, no. So, so the, trades, the trades are not going to happen on the blockchain. It's just going to be like other assets where uh, you can deposit into the exchange, trade around, and then withdraw uh, back into your wallet or, or whoever else. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what is the performance that you, that you measured? Transaction performance. Our transaction performance? So I'm trying to even remember. Um, I believe we set our block times to be like two minutes or two and a half minutes. And I think we set our block sizes to be a couple of megabytes. Um, but we, we haven't done like a full stress test of the system because it doesn't have any volume. Uh, and it's going to be really easy to hard fork. So, you know, if we ever get anywhere near, you know, capacity, and, and you know, folks are actually using it. So, well, I guess to actually answer your question, that would put us at what, like eight or ten times Bitcoin transaction capacity. So that would be like what thirty transactions per second. Yeah. Uh, so thirty transactions per second. Um, not bad. Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see uh, how it goes. Um, so is this platform for trading the asset you want? Uh, uh, yeah, so this is specifically for RMG, but, but, but this is Alpha Point's trading platform. So Alpha Point uh, makes their trading engine available for anyone who wants to basically, uh, I guess, pay them for like a white label solution. <laughs> Of yes. And I'm trading the digital, the you know, gold asset that I bought from the Yeah. That, the, the symbol for trading that is technology. Uh, yes, in this case. Yeah. Can you ever take, so you probably said this already, but you, you don't take possession of the private key, it's always uh, you have the user key. 
so yeah, it's all two out of three multi-sig, but uh, like once you get your RMG and it's deposited into your wallet that you have created, uh, you're now you're in a two out of three key setup where you have one key, the wallet uh, provider has one key, and then a third party recovery service has the third key. Uh, let's see, we... I have a really good software wallet that I really just have to log in as a website Right, so uh, this is specifically using like BIP32 key derivation. I, we do not support the BIP for the like 12... Uh, 12 word recovery phrase we have, we, we, we create, like when you create your wallet, you get a uh, PDF basically with your encrypted recovery data on it. Um, it's just like blobs of JSON basically, but then we have recovery tools and recovery processes and the, the key recovery service is its own type of protocol that we developed a uh, year, year and a half ago. Um, but at the, at the beginning of like RMG launch, the only wallet is going to be BitGo. Uh, we are a web wallet, but we also have uh, APIs and SDKs. So really the vast majority of people that use BitGo do not use us as a web wallet. They actually have uh, our SDK running on their own uh, servers and they're doing all their key signing and stuff on their own computers and sending a half signed transaction to our server. And then we then you know, decide whether or not to co-sign. Yeah. 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 So, so this is specifically gold uh, trading uh, with RMG, but uh, you know, from a sort of stepping back at a higher level, uh, you could potentially do this with any physical asset that you want to digitize uh, using uh, Prova software to you know create a new blockchain, a new network for whatever digital asset it is that you want to use. Uh, so this was kind of just like going more into the specifics about you know the first production use case of RMG. Uh, these are some of the, the partners that came together to do this. Uh, basically, BitGo, which is uh, my employer, we were the ones who actually developed the protocol, and uh, we were able to reuse a lot of work that we've done over the years with regards to uh, key signing and key recovery uh, type of technologies. And then AlphaPoint came in with their trading software. Uh, CME is, of course, on the financial side, and the Royal Mint is really the, the gold vaulting side, and they're the, the primary drivers uh, of all of this. And so, you know, BitGo, uh, we have a long track record. We've been used by a lot of different digital asset uh, related companies, and uh, that basically covers all of it. So, if we have more questions, Looks like we got one back there. I noticed on the, uh, the trading software that the trades were essentially done in uh, gold and uh, um, USDT. Yeah. Is there any sort of handle like, the spread of, of the dollars as well as the, the storage of gold? Or is that something that's actually done in software? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I don't. As far as I'm aware, the, no. I believe Alpha Point is going to be the one actually managing the trading aspect of it. Um, and of course, long term, we don't want that to be the only exchange. Like because um, because this is a blockchain protocol that is very, very, very similar to Bitcoin. We expect that if this system gains significant adoption, then you will see a lot of other uh, like crypto exchanges out there that may want to add support for it. So long term, RMG uh, will hopefully get traded on many different exchanges. So you can see a future then where RMG is trading against Bitcoin or Ethereum or other other exchanges that are trying to do that. Yeah, like if, if there is you know, sufficient demand and volume, then uh, any number of trading pairs could get created. Um, and I think, you know, I think that there have been like one or two attempts at, at like crypto tokens that are supposedly backed by gold over the years and that they've all really fallen apart. And I, I think that most of that is due to the fact that none of the vaulting institutions uh, 
had really anywhere near the level of, of trust that the Royal Mint has. Uh, it's always been sort of like fly-by-night companies that you know pop up out of nowhere and like claim to have a lot of gold, and you're not even really sure if they're being honest with you. Uh, so hopefully, you know, this particular system will be able to to do a, a lot better and go a lot further than uh, the previous. Uh, tries at a, a gold token. Yeah. Um, so is, is Royal Mint actually a royalty? <laughs> Uh, well, I believe it was um, Her Majesty's Royal Mint. So I believe there is some, you know, lineage that goes back to uh, royalty basically saying, you know, we need to have a mint for uh, the, uh, the crown, basically, right? The crown mint, and then we, we will issue our money from that. So I believe that there is a lineage that you know, goes back with royalty, but... Uh, like the Royal Bank of Scotland, yeah, yeah, yeah. for instance. You know, is, is it a derivative of... Some some actual physical bit, but but you say that it's it's, it's kind of. Dispersed, dispersed over time. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm not actually you know f completely familiar with the like the history of uh, you know ownership and management who, who of the mint. Get into bed with? Yeah. <laughs> well, you'd have to ask uh, our CEO that because he's the one who does the business side. I'm just the tech guy. <laughs> so is there, is there, is there, is there an intent at some point to be able to do payments across this? Like, could I put the oh, yeah. user to serve sell the service and transfer gold to me as a payment? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no reason why you couldn't. Yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't use it as a payment rail. Um, of course. You think that's their intent? Um, well, you know, this is definitely starting with, like, store of value. Uh, this is, like, this is. Uh, I mean, next next generation technology for gold bugs, right? It's, uh, when, you, when you invest in this, you're basically buying some portion of the gold they, they maintain, right? They sell it anyway, so I mean, yeah. You, so you have it digitally, um, so you can use. This. So I can see this becoming a real val a gold backed cryptocurrency, basically what, what it looks like. Is there? A, do they do anything with the Nasdaq and the at all? Are they associated with that? Not that I'm aware of, but I'm not sure. Consensus, I thought that they were talking about some kind of association. Yeah, but no, I don't know. Um, but but no, the so yeah, so the like one RMG, which is like the same unit as one Bitcoin. One RMG is uh, equivalent and will always be equivalent to one gram of gold. Um, and I don't I don't remember what the minimum limitation is, but whatever when you have these tokens, these IOUs, you can send them to the Royal Mint and cash in, you know, for physical delivery of that amount of gold. I'm sure they have some minimum order there. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, and there's probably a fee associated. Um, but that is, I think, you know, why this system has a lot more promise than previous, like, gold cryptocurrencies. This one, uh, you know, no, nothing is 100. Yeah, yeah. When you get uh, 100,000 people to have this, had this bought gold from them, there's no reason you couldn't transact back to anyone with 100,000 Yeah, exactly. Without um, ever having taken ownership of gold. Yeah, so I mean, we you could you could feasibly use this uh, network to to build a new type of payment system, or you know you could integrate it into your current crypto payment systems and say, hey, do you want to send Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum or RMG or or what have you? Um, and of course, we certainly hope that does happen, and that we get to the point where we have to start worrying about on-chain scalability problems. Well, I can um, see why they want it to happen too. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it makes their environment attractive. Yeah. A lot of other things just like yeah. Yes. Are there um, any implementations other than RMG kind of coming out the pipe Roma or anything you've considered maybe you've used before? Um, so the way that I think this is going to play out is that um, we are constantly in talks with all kinds of traditional financial institutions and that 
inevitably some of them will have you know a similar need to a system like this but it won't be exactly the same and so they're gonna I guess so the, this is kind of one of one of the the new business avenues that Bidgo is going down is you know custom blockchain protocol uh, type of service uh, and so you know when we, we talk to these various institutions if they have a need for their own permission blockchain and we believe that you know Prova is a good fit for that but might just need a little tweaking then it would probably come down to you know us working on some new specifications for for new features that they would want in their protocol and we roll it into prova and of course it gets open source use at that point but um, that would be kind of my ultimate hope is that a lot of the institutions end up bitgo to, to write open source software that can Somebody else who wants to use it. Yeah, so um, you know it's going to use the exact same type of probably level DB uh, data store. Well, at the node level, uh, you know whatever BTCD uses, which is probably level DB. Um, but then, you know, no, you can't build enterprise infrastructure on level DB um, All right. and really this is what has happened in the entire uh, blockchain ecosystem um, um, I don't know it's changed a few times right they started with some other but but so like you can build you can build nodes and consensus systems uh, that yeah. use that use like level DB type stuff. But if you're then if you then want an enterprise grade like we're doing you know hundred thousand queries um, every you know few seconds type of thing, then you're gonna want to have probably some more scalable type of database. So, so like what we do, this is really what my job is at BitGo, is to build these backend infrastructure. And really what I do is I, I build services that connect to the nodes that are, are running on level DB or BDB or whatever, and just suck all the data out of them and then put them into a more scalable data structure like uh, you know uh, Hadoop or HBase, uh, or, or even uh, Mongo works pretty well for, for a lot of uh, small, medium-sized stuff. Some of the other blockchains. Yeah, so um, it's we've tried not to stray too far from like what the, the standard uh, technology is, the technology stack that has do been used. And do you depend on the permission? part of the, your data store to handle your permissions? Or do you do that outside? No, no. So, so all of the permissions happen like at a protocol level. Well, you could argue. I mean, there is data in the data store that says you know who has permission to do what, and that is the um, the administrator you know chain of transactions throughout the history of the Prova blockchain. Uh, basically, says you know we're changing this permission setting or that permission setting or what have you, um, and so from that you build sort of administrator UTS. So set that is like what is the current settings of the system from a permissioning standpoint? Uh, uh, yes. I would imagine eventually customers of the system would want to see between their the first and the second. Yeah. They say they have a hundred million times of gold there. So it's something that's not going to be able to fix it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, unlike a lot of the paper ETFs, I think uh, the, the auditing uh, requirements uh, are a lot higher, and uh, so. Oil Mint does audits twice a year. They say they reconcile their reserves daily and do a full audit twice a year. Um, I, 
I imagine those audits are available publicly. They, if they're not, then that would be kind of worthless. It would be particularly... They're doing that today. Yeah, yeah. They've been doing that for who knows how long. Um, they did around like 200, 300 years. Uh, a thousand years. A thousand? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, yes. So this this is not meant to be the like of record all of their gold. RMG is actually only a tiny, tiny fraction of their vaulted gold product. So what percentage? But basically, as they onboard new users, they will allocate more of their vaulted gold to be RMG gold. Um, and as they do that, uh, they will that will get reflected in their audits, and it will get reflected in the system as they uh, provision or allocate and deallocate the digital uh, assets within RMG. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so of course, uh, amongst the ability to provision and deprovision the, the validator keys and the wallet keys, there has to also be a way to provision and deprovision the administrator keys. And these, of course, they're, these will be like initialization parameters that need to get decided by the creators of the system when they originally create it. Um, I forget, I'm not even sure like what RMG settled on. It was probably something like five out of seven or five out of 10 or something like that. Um, so you, you, know, you wanna have uh, both redundancy um, and uh, requirement of you know, multiple trusted people that you are not going to all collude against you at the same time, right? Well, at uh, at the end of the day, like the whole system can get changed in any way that the owners want. So it's not it's not a it's not a like permanent security concern. There are, of course. Basically, if, if enough administrator keys got compromised, someone could really screw with the system for a short period of time, but people would notice pretty quickly, and then you know the rest of the administrators would come in and say, no, we need to fix this. Um, and, and my guess is they probably cycle those. Oh, yeah. Often, so it's not like it's going to stay, the administrative stay there for long periods. I'm sure they have some requirements that says, you know, every two days or something, you have to change these things. But they can find out behind that, you know what I'm saying? You know, you put out that thing, you can find the behind that, you know what I'm saying? You mean for like trying to detect compromised keys or something? Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, you can do that. You can do that. Yeah, it, it wasn't, I guess, too much of a concern, um, at least for RMG. Yeah, so that, that's what, like, what we're really trying to do in this system is create uh, automated logic that can find you know anything that's going wrong in the system. Um, it's a lot more important to have that like fully fledged 100% coverage when you're talking about a public permissionless system. Uh, you can be a little bit more lax when you're talking about like a system that is controlled by uh, a number of, of companies or entities or, or what have you. So yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. Uh, it, it, might, it might not be worth it, you know, the risk reward. Like it, I imagine they might think the risk is so low and, and the payoff for like, you know, saving of downtime or something might not be worth like the effort that would require to, to go into that. So the future of an onboarding users, they have to know that they can get their keys and 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 they can get their keys
Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they must be saving some money somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, it's also just good, good marketing, I guess. You know, get in on, uh, on the blockchain uh, craze while it's, it's still a uh, really hot sector. Hey, um, I mean, for our I mean, we had a system to buy the way they work that, you know, the yeah, just like per performance issues of, of having yeah, too, too many transactions and stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we hope that that is a problem that we will have to deal with. Uh, but like I said, like at the... So, no, we ended up solving it. We knew what was wrong with it. Ah, fi finding the bottlenecks and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we hope that that is a problem that we have to deal with and, you know, then have to spend more engineering time uh, solving scalability issues. But as for right now, we're just waiting for them to actually turn the system on and, and then, uh, you know, we'll adjust as things go. Uh, I'm sure Baco has some sort of contract like in place already, you know, with the Royal Mint that basically says, you know, we're going to be monitoring and making adjustments as necessary, you know, as the system grows and has growing pains. So it's pretty much inevitable. Yeah. So your scalability like that, G4 from pretty much all um, scalability is really going to depend on a number of different things. Like we, we don't have SegWit support in Prova because I don't think BTCD has SegWit support. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the B, most of the BTC developers don't work on it anymore. I think they work on Decred mostly. They've created their own um, cryptocurrency. And uh, uh, like with regard to Lightning payment channel stuff, Maybe, of course, you would need SegWit first. Um, that's that would be a really, really good problem to have. Like, if we got to the point where we needed a second layer network, but then uh, we, we've talked about this a little bit. Creating second layer networks could potentially cause uh, regulatory compliance issues. Maybe um, you then uh, you start getting into you start enabling all these really cool cypherpunk things like, you know, um, cross-chain atomic swaps and all that stuff. And so then the question becomes, you know, what happens if, if someone is, you know, using or owning or trading RMG and they're actually an, an unidentified person? You know, uh, what actors within this uh, regulated system might be uh, in like legal trouble if there are uh, people who are doing that. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, it sounds cool to me, but uh, I think it is like some sort of uh, potential regulatory issue. I mean, it's a brave new world and we're creating these n completely new systems that have never enabled this type of stuff before. Yeah. So especially for this particular asset, is there something to prevent them if you know, the fabric of society starts to fall apart from them just saying, oh, we lost the keys, somebody hacked the system, we have no idea who owns anything, so it's just all ours. Um, you mean like if, if the administrators of the wallets were to like feign ignorance and say, no, we, we, can't, ha we can't let you, you know, claim your physical delivery of the gold right. anymore? I mean, just, I mean, in, in a world where the regular societal rules are present, uh, you have a court system, you have ways to sort of fight your battles, but if some of that stuff falls apart, um, especially when you're talking about gold, which is a durable physical asset, yeah. if they're able to keep it, there's not really, if you have no record of what you own that 
verifiable outside of the blockchain itself, they could just keep all that gold, right? And yeah, so um, this would not be the most ideal system for like a doomsday prepper uh, gold investor. Um, so I, I would say like really like your best recourse of... Uh, people buy gold, I'm not going to hurt you. People yeah, yeah. buy gold because of that fact. Yeah. If, if society falls apart, gold is going to be one thing that's going to be there supposedly. Yeah. Continue on without. Yeah, but or or they're buying gold because they know other people are buying gold because of that because I mean all these people buying these gold ETF products like yeah. they're never going to be able to get the gold. Yeah. So that's what happened. I mean, when when people started trying to buy physical gold, they called up the royal men or anybody else and said, "Hey, I want to buy some gold," and they found out it was pretty hard to do. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's didn't to figure out if they could have it, but the royal men said, "Well, okay, I don't want to lose that customer." I'll just give them something like this. So that, I think that's what they're doing. Yeah, so I would say that like your your best recourse in, in that type of adversarial situation uh, would have to be the courts and the legal system. And there's actually a strong precedent there of you know cryptographic signatures and, and, and chains of, of history. Um, you know, we, we had a we actually had a lawyer speak here last year and she talked about how like there's already a number of court cases with precedents of of you know proving ownership of crypto graphic assets. So, so there's, a, there's a record of it outside of their interest system that you'd be able to save somehow to ship. Well, there's the blockchain itself. Um, so anyone who wants to can run the software, download and verify the entire history of the blockchain and have a copy of it and then be able to show, you know, I have the private cryptographic key that unlocks the funds in these addresses. And so, you know, you, you would probably have to pull in an expert witness in the court, but my understanding is that this has already been done a number of times uh, for other cases. Have you seen this one, the blockchain, the lawyers in Switzerland for the gold, you know, you sign up, I mean, to monetize and everything, it's a blockchain for lawyers, huh. for, for, uh, for, for the gold, Woo. and the lawyers have designed that, you know, saying okay, you have to sign up that just in case anything happens, you know, it's, it's I, I mean, they've designed that, then you sign up first with them, and then for, then with your gold, if anything goes wrong with that, the lawyers already have the blockchain for that, and hmm. they can prove to them that it's already been set up for that. In my one is called out uh, and all that stuff. Hmm. It's in Switzerland, it's already been up and running now, you know what I'm saying, for that. No, I'm, I mean, there's so many of these, you know, blockchains and, and various crypto yeah, token well, well, yes, products. Yeah, they have one which is uh, up and running right now with things like uh, uh, trading and all that stuff. It's up uh, and running and all that stuff just in case anything, you know, to prove and everything and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, there is going to be, well, a lot of industries are going to have to adapt, you know, the, the legal industry is already adapting, you know, to incorporate this technology uh, into their day-to-day -day use. It's just a, another tool to add to the toolbox, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, yeah? Is the, what inside the vault? Look, this whole blockchain concept of still the people that want access to the gold in the vault to track the gold that's actually in the vault, uh. the gold bars. So, uh, so the, the problem with, I guess, blockchains in general is the same problem of, of any database, is it garbage in, garbage out, right? Absolutely. So at, at the end of the day, some human is going to be putting those numbers in. Like, until we get like some, you know, uh, now I've been hearing rumblings of like blockchain plus AI, which I don't even really know what that means yet. But, uh, you know, if we get to the point where you can have like trustless uh, robots you know that they've been programmed to do their task and, and they're set up in such a way that you can be hundred percent sure that they're only doing the exact thing that they were programmed to do and then they can go like those robots can go audit the gold you know maybe you could start to create some sort of new you know trust chain uh, from that standpoint this system there's you have that traceability. It's not a like you said, but you do have that traceability. Yeah. traditional can happen, but not as easy as Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's definitely one of the, the primary differences 
even though we, we have, we can be comparing two different systems that have administrators, um, your traditional database system, the administrator, if they really know what they're doing, can probably go in there and, and delete stuff and basically cover their tracks. But the, while the administrators in this system can technically screw you over and delete your money out of the system, uh, they have to do that in a transparent way that everybody else in the system has a, a, a record of. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you know, just take for instance, uh, we're, we're using artificial intelligence and all that stuff to audit, you know what I'm saying? You raise, when we do an MRI and you raise the red flag to the blockchain, raise the red, red flag to insurances, but the doctors still go back and do it, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and change the wrong way. I think this is a great idea, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I think healthcare is also going to get revolutionized by all this. Yes. All right. Great. One last question. Sure. When did you say 